Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Roger Johnson. I'm the CCS's London programme organiser, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody, uh, both online and in the room, uh, to today's presentation. And a particular welcome to John Carrington, who is our speaker. The topic for today is the mobile revolution, the early days of cellular, 1983 to 93, a personal view. And John was very much at the heart um, of that, of the developments in that period. Uh, he was with the post office and with BT, and he became managing director of BT's cellular project in May, 1983. And that will no doubt be uh, the starting point of this afternoon's talk. And that company would then launch the service as Cellnet in January 1985. John, over to you. Thanks, Roger, very much. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, this afternoon, both in physically and virtually. Now, my talk today is really a personal view of one, I think, one of the most exciting developments in communications, the advent of mass mobile communications. I will outline in this talk the developments of the technology and markets in the UK from 1983 until 1993, covering first and second generation networks. And of course, we're on to generation four, elements of generation five are coming up now. That's, that's how it's, it's grown in the last, as we said, it, it, in the last 40 years, May 83 starts the uh, when, when the, well, the first license was issued in March 83, and the second one in May 83, when I became involved. I will also, also offer my own perspectives on the various threads of technology and politics, and, those, and the way in which they influence what happened. Now, in some areas, I'm not able to go into, into considerable detail. This is a bit of a sweep. But I think the last uh, 40 years with Cellular has shown a great example of Moore's Law being delivered. Fantastic integration chips, which led from that to that in 10 years. That's one of the last old analog systems. Even the first digital systems were still quite big. So that's the first GSM that I ever had in 1992, I think. And that came out just a, a couple of years later. So that's what we're talking about, what you can do with computing. It's also about mass market manufacturing. What you do if you go from being able to address a small market to a large market and the economies that you can get from that. And there's also, I think, an example of what you can do when you cooperate internationally, both in terms of technology, in terms of standards, in terms of radio frequency allocation, and politically. And that's what this story, I think, demonstrates. Now, mobile before cellular. So phones in cars have actually been around for almost 40 years by the time my story starts. They were bulky and until the advent of the BT System 4, which is, uh, was interesting, had a push to talk button. So if you wanted to talk, they were unidirectional. They were like um, things you'd see in, uh, on boats or planes user had to say over <laughs> and even with system four which was the system that came in and, and allowed you to direct dial and have a two-way talk just like an ordinary telephone uh, i was saying to roger before the before the meeting you had to know where you, the person you were calling was because there were different numbers or different allocations prefixes depending on if you're in manchester or birmingham or london or in brighton so the system couldn't track where you were. You had to tell somebody, I'm going to Brighton. If you want me in my, in my car, you call this number and then my number. So that's where we were 40 years ago. 
In 1983, they were, limited, they were limited in number and range by the technology and available frequencies. Demand was always, however, outstripped supply. So even with those rather cumbersome phones, there was a strong black market for car for phones in cars, and they were over, they were between three and four thousand pounds a ton. Couldn't get enough. This is a reminder, this is a slide I referred to earlier, of what things were like in the heady days of System 3. The good thing was you've got good coverage, and in fact, we didn't take System 3 out of service until the end of the 1980s because there was excellent coverage in Scotland. So why is cellular so important? The secret, as I'm sure most of you know, is in frequency reuse enabled by the computer technology that came about that didn't allow system four to know where you were in the country automatically so for example with the pre-cellular systems you could only reuse the frequencies over quite long distances so for example if you were using frequencies in london they couldn't be reused until birmingham such was the, you know, the power of the output, the fact that technology was not up to, to using smaller cells than that. And we've come a long way since then, such that the slide that I, I have got here shows you that, for example, if the yellow was London, um, and the, uh, the green would be Birmingham, the gray would be Newcastle, and so on and so forth. Today, we're talking about the yellow being here, the green being next door, or in, in the foyer, <laughs> the blue being in the room next door there. Such is the distance that we've come in the last 40 years to allow us to deal with the capacity which is needed to, to, to the fact that you've all got mobile telephones in your pockets, probably, probably some of them one or two. Now, the origins of cellular. <coughs> cellular. It started really with Bell Labs in the 1960s. The invention of the transistor and the microprocessor allowed the complex task of tracking the mobile to take place, which you couldn't do before. However, it wasn't until the 1980s that the US regulatory process via the Federal Communications Commission allowed commercial operations with two operators in each city region allocated by a competitive tender. Um, it's interesting that it, this, this often has taken place in, in US developments of technology. The Federal Communications Commission, for those who don't know, is a, is a judicial body. And um, it can take, well, as you see here, years from pleading to do things to, to get it through uh, through that body so the technology oftentimes has been advanced in advance of the ability to adopt it commercially trials were opened in chicago and washington baltimore one by motorola and the other one by at t in 1983 they operated at 800 megahertz which were the frequencies that have been allocated for mobile meanwhile during this regulatory process others had entered the market especially the very successful pan nordic system which opened in 1981 that used 450 megahertz which allows which allows you to see further and it's quite advantageous in areas with thinly populated you know that are thinly populated now in the uk margaret thatcher's government promoted competition in telecom, telecommunications uh, where with Sir Keith Joseph, who was the, the author of a lot of, uh, of the policies at that time for the Tories, heading the Department of Trade and Industry. They started, of course, with BT itself, as it became, Post Office Telecommunications, uh, with competition there with Mercury. And in 1982, the government announced that there would be two operators for cellular with separate resellers 
providing services and mobiles to end customers. So in fact, what they said was the network itself, the networks, there will be two, they will not supply mobiles directly to customers. They will have to go through third parties who will have to be licensed resellers. Now this approach is designed to boost competition and involve more businesses in the markets as to have had more than two network operators would have greatly diminished capacity. Every time you split frequencies between operators, you, you greatly reduce the capacity of the network to handle the number of customers. Frequencies at the 900 megahertz range were freed up from both the military and the old 405 line broadcasting channels, which, as you know, were replaced by 625 when color came in. There was also, intriguingly, a small set of frequencies which were used by secure devices in shops, which we had to put a working party together to deal with, because otherwise, every time you went into a shop with one of these, you would have set the alarm off with your mobile. <laughs> <laughs> and the newly created regulator, Optel, would judge competitive bids for licenses. The UK bidding process. BT was not guaranteed a license, although it would like one. It had been planning a new system involving cellular, which of course was going to be imaginatively called System 5. The government insisted BT had to find a partner in order to bid for a license. And Securicor emerged as a partner in a 40% share of the proposed operating company, which became imaginatively known as Telecom Securicor Cellular Radio. <laughs> so why Securicor? Well, as most of you know, they, they were noted for carrying large, you know, secure, mainly money between banks and offices and, and, and retail outlets. Well, one of their diversifications from their security carriage business had been selling and installing pre-cellular mobiles like the one you saw before. They also had a, an extensive private mobile network, which they needed for their own security but in their vans, but they also made that available to third parties. A second license was awarded to a joint venture between Raykel, Millicom and Hambros in 19, March 1983. That's where I come into the picture. I was appointed to establish and lead the BT Securicor joint venture in May 1983, which was the month when our license was issued. The UK cellular standard then. The UK was driven by government industrial policy to help UK industry with opportunities for exports. Things were tight. A great deal of resource from BT Research in Martlesham in Suffolk the DTI, Raykel, and BT Joint Ventures was applied to the work. Uh, the standard emerged was actually shortcut, was based on the US AMP system that had been developed by, uh, to serve their cellular market, American mobile phone system. And it emerged really only just in time for manufacturers to meet the deadline for service, which was, according to the license, had to start in January or the beginning of 1985, by, I think by March 1985. A key decision was that the calling party would pay. I don't know if you even remember this, because in the States, I don't know if it's still so today, if you called a mobile, a cellular mobile, the person you were calling actually paid the bill. <laughs> so we felt that by doing that, some people would not accept calls, and that was the case in the States. And it did help to, well, it slowed down the take up of mobiles there. Um, and then how the post started, you could send a letter and you could, if you didn't receive it. That was before the penny post, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the entire, <coughs> you had to pay as a receiver. That's why it exploded in May 1840, wasn't it? <laughs> the standard was sufficiently important for government 
for the Secretary of State, who was then Norman Tebbit, to sign the document launching it. And this is the facing page, which tells people about the new British UK you know, um, uh, telecoms uh, access system. Now the market, we were entering really uncharted waters. And the market forecasts at that time do reflect that. In Mar this, is, this is something we did in March, 1984, for Telecom Securicore Cellular Radio. And it's actually very conservative with the benefit of hindsight. But what it's difficult to remember is just how skeptical the public were, well, the public as represented by the media and uh, the city. Uh, they could not see an explosion in this area. There wasn't enough other market, there weren't enough other markets to, to test it. I'll come back to our forecast later on. And on the supply side, as I said, the key terms of the network provision were to encourage competition following the US example. And there were two operators, each with 25 year licenses. There were strict coverage targets and the networks had to sell through third parties. The chosen network manufacturers were Thorne Ericsson for Raycal and Motorola for Telecom Securicor Cellular Radio. So there we are in 1983, beginning of 1984, working on the standard, beginning to plan the networks, which was then done with OS maps and tracing paper in order to get the uh, ability to be able to do free frequency reuse. And 1984 actually proved a key year for understanding the potential of mobile. The Nordic and US networks had actually proved successful. But we still had very little idea of what the UK demand would be. An opportunity to put a toe in the demand water arose when, tele when Telecom Securicor, so in a radio, we took up a challenge to provide a pilot network for the G7 summit in June 1984. What we did was we put up six overlapping cells covering central London, Gatwick, which is where Reagan, President Reagan and others would, would come in, and, and uh, the roads in between, A23. London Gatwick in A23. Now, the tax standard wasn't finally ready by June 1984. And so for the manufacturers, for, and so we used modified AMPS system applied to the telecom securicore frequencies. And the test of the technology <laughs> and the UK customer intent, the pilot network actually was a great success. I chose the time to have our first ad in the Financial Times, and this is it, featuring Ronald Reagan, who was at that summit. And as it probably says, being out of the office need be the end of the world. <laughs> and we launched the name Cellnet and the brand. Actually, using the president was sailing close to the wind, and uh, well, I got my collar felt, but, it, but the embassy liked it, and I think other people beyond it liked it. And they asked for copies, so there's a we breathe a sigh of relief. What was interesting was from that one advert <coughs> in the Financial Times, which you had to clip out, we got fifteen thousand responses. After the summit, we had permission to keep the system up for about two or three weeks. And we fitted out a coach with phones, and we had a number of the, uh, the hand portables, the Motorola ones, 10 Motorola Dynatax. And I spent a lot of time with potential customers. The key thing for me is everyone who used one wanted one. So that was a signal for me to ask funders the, for more money for the network, which I got. We were able finally to show what the pent up demand looked like. I also realized that BT, despite its huge network, did lack the necessary project management 
skills to provide a network in the time required. Remember, this is June 84. We had to have the system up by March 85. So uh, the suggestion was made and I jumped at it. We brought in W.S. Atkins to help us with the project planning. And if you don't know W.S. Atkins, they're the people who do nuclear power stations and motorways, probably somewhere deeply involved in HS1 and HS2. And that really made a huge difference to our ability to put up the network. Cellnet and Motorola's unique position in the supply of handheld phones to build the worst uh, allowed us to build the first network in the world, which was designed to support hand portables, like this one, this is not a Motorola one, rather than phones in cars. You need more phones <coughs> because the frequency, the, the power in that has to be limited Otherwise, it's microwave. You could, you know, it, it could cause problems. <laughs> so the power output from that has to be matched by more, a nearer cell. And it's, it's, it seems rather strange today, as I say, that we're probably surrounded by, by cells here. But that wasn't the case 40 years ago, obviously. Uh, at 3,300 pounds, that's what we sold them for, we couldn't get enough of, them, of the Motorola handsets. When we launched and this was the um, this was the beast this was the one that that we launched service with and was a very good piece of equipment cellnet tried to launch actually ahead of the game on christmas day 1984 on the noel Edmonds show <clears throat> like calais it's engraved on my heart but sadly one of our guys who was out in the field, forgot to press the end button on the tiny attack that he was using. And Noel Edmonds, who was sitting there with my chairman in the post office tower, could only get the engaged tone <laughs> when he called Johnny Morris, who was in Regent's Park. <laughs> so, uh, does he have luck? Remember what Napoleon said? So the first commercial call was actually claimed by Rocco on the 1st of January 1985. Demand thereafter, <coughs> fantastic. So this was the, uh, the, 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 the coverage at launch or in the early part of 1986 that was picked up by the, the new scientist in 1985. The networks did spread fast to meet the coverage conditions of the licenses. We opened at, in Birmingham and on the motorway to London, and we were serving out towards Dover and into East Anglia. Don't ask me why East Anglia, probably because I lived there. <laughs> this was something that was said to me fairly early on in the piece. It, the fast UK coverage, coverage soon raised questions from customers about international and connectivity. They liked the beast so much. Because there was none. A pan-European standard had been under discussion since 1982 in a group called GSM, which is what the standards now called. In those days, it was the Group Special Mobile and was part of uh, a pan-European uh, network of largely monopolies called SEPT, which represented both telecoms and posts, and was actually quite good at developing standards, but they, it took a long time. And really, it was bogged down by national industrial policies. I started to explore cooperation in Europe early on, and I visited Paris in February 1986 to meet my opposite numbers from France and Germany. I let the DTI know beforehand that I was going, and I had a, a, a quite a strong note from them saying, agree nothing. So what they didn't want to do was undermine the potential of tax as an international uh, export opportunity. I 
I had another role soon after the launch of Cellnet. I had it before that, but I didn't take it up. I was director of mobile by then at BT. And I was convinced that the future of mobile was tied up with an international agreement on standards. My experience in BT International, which is where I'd been before, <coughs> had shown how potent agreement on standards could be as a stimulant to growth in telecommunications. During my time in, in BT International, we introduced direct dialing for people internationally. And if you look at the graphs, I mean, they, the, the demand just went off, off the scale. You didn't have to go through an operator. And that was about agreeing standards. The success of the new cellular networks and the fact that continental industrial interests could dominate a pan-European standard did actually cause a review to take place in the DTI. And I do think my lobbying helped a bit there. All of that anon. 1985 saw a rapid growth in the market, stimulated not just by meeting pent up demand, but also by actions by Cellnet and Raykel aimed at taking competitive advantage. So that a year later, after launch, BT cut the price of its cheapest car phone by 50% and bundled the phone with the rental, which is what happens today. So that's, that's still... However, all this success had a cost. High demand stressed both the networks, especially Cellnet, where the Motorola exchanges, which were actually designed for US city regions, proved to be too small. There was a plan to introduce uh, to the, you know, five times the size switches, computing computers, but they were late. <clears throat> for Cellnet, the stress on the switches caused them to shut down. They're just like any other computer. They gave up, reinitialized, and started up again, which was wonderful for the computer, but didn't do much for the customers. <laughs> they were left out there without a service. Raykel had a similar problem, but they had larger switches from, uh, from Ericsson. Their problem was at the, at the margins of the areas covered by cells where you would drop out. That's not quite as serious. And we did lose market share. So the loss of market share caused the network outage. Let me suggest to Motorola that they should partner with somebody else we worked with elsewhere, which was Siemens, who by then didn't have a, a they had a, a mobile operation, but it was still in the old pre-cellular system that was operating in Germany, but they had a large digital exchanges capable of meeting demand. Motorola and Siemens did become partners in 1986, and the bigger switches stabilised the network. UK market powered ahead despite frustrations with coverage and network outages. The Sunday Times motoring correspondent, I always remember reading this um, one, uh, uh, one weekend, put it, first of all, mobiles were a novelty. Then there was the frustration when the call dropped out, which we, know we all experience that still, but never mind. But then it becomes a way of life. And so it, I think, has remained. This was the coverage that Solnet had, had achieved by mid-1986. That's so quite extensive. <clears throat> During 1985, the DTI and Raquel agreed that they needed to be part of the GSM plan. GSM was to be a digital standard and involved a huge amount of work on all fronts. Resources had been scarce until in 1986, something which I think is a wonderful name, but is part of the SEPT concept. A permanent nucleus was established of professional engineers with staff seconded from European telecoms operators. And I'm very proud to have seconded a key member of my team and now their team, 
chap called Bernard Malinder, who'd been the founding technical director at Zelnet, to help with the work that needed to be done. So the progress on the technical standards started to be made at a pace. Political agreement wasn't important as it was important as technical agreement in establishing GSM because, as I said before, the standard was very much tied up with the different manufacturers backed by government saying we have an export opportunity here. In 1987, there was discussion between the UK, France, Germany, and Italy at a governmental level. And that led to a key four party intergovernmental agreement to support the development of GSM. The standards work would be supported and research shared. And I'm proud to be a signatory of that agreement. Uh, and the last time I saw this, one of these was, there was a display of it, it's in the Science Museum. The political accord was followed by European operators signing a memorandum of understanding on developing GSM in September of 1987. In 1988, the two operator per market model was adopted, as well as open interfaces between operators. The GSM specification was ready to go to manufacturers. The growth in the UK market prompted the UK government to look beyond 900 megahertz at that stage. So they, they were not only looking at cooperation, they were looking at what comes next. And requests were made for bands at 1800 megahertz to be made available for mobile telecommunications. The growth in the UK mobile market had been fast. And by March 1988, which is just over three years after the launch of the networks, there were 600,000 customers in the UK. When you think back, when, we, when you know, when the two cellular operators launched, I think there were about 16,000 pre-cellular mobile units in the market. So we've gone from 16,000 to 600,000 in three years. 95% of the population was covered. Increasingly, customers were interested in handheld devices rather than just phones in cars. And this gave rise to, a per, to the personal communications initiative the DTI ended by Lord Young, which actually manifested itself in two ways. Something called Telepoint, which some of you may remember, which was a cordless phone solution for use in wide area, and PCN, or Personal Communications Networks, using 1800, mega, uh, 1800 megahertz frequencies, but the GSM standard. This, this, this was also a stimulus, the, the size of the phone, to people wanting handhelds that could slip in their pocket. And this, uh, in 1989, this is pre this is still the old analog system. This was the first flip phone that Motorola launched in 1989. It was really first pocket size that wouldn't, wouldn't put up, you know, cord your, your clothes to, burn, to um, Bulge. I'm very sexist there because my wife always complains mobile operator or mobile manufacturers never think about the needs of women who tend not to have pockets about their person. <laughs> so this was Telepoint. Uh, it's for a network, this is in the UK, for a public cordless telephone transmitter system we're called for by the DTI. And this is the successful BT application, PhonePoint. The idea was that there would be cordless uh, receivers, uh, uh, transmitters installed with quite low power, mainly in towns and cities. And when you were near one, you could make calls. Uh, I don't think you could receive calls, if my memory serves me right, but you could make calls. It wasn't a success. Manufacturers could not produce devices which work satisfactory in the mobile environment. There was no handoff. So if you move, you were walking with your phone, you would lose the call. 
it wouldn't hand off to the next uh, Wi-Fi, uh, or perhaps cordless, not Wi-Fi system. The networks, in the end of the day, were shut down after about two years. Also, of course, with the, with the handheld um, cellular sets, there was strong competition there with something that would hand off, and you could use not just in city centres or, or thereabouts, but in, in, a, in a much wider area. Today, of course, the idea of telepoint is fulfilled by public Wi-Fi, uh, which is a useful adjunct to the intense use of cellular radio. The UK called for the first bids for PCN in 1989. And Mercury PCN, whose bid I led after leaving BT in 1989, was awarded a license along with Unitel and Microtel. Mercury was a subsidy, subsidiary of Cable and Wireless and was partnered in the bid, successful bid, for a PCN license by Telefonica and Motorola. PCN needed more base sites for reasons I've already explained, because at 1800 megahertz, the signals travel less far than they do at 900. <clears throat> so it's good for towns and cities, but expensive for rural areas. That expense over time <coughs> led to the operators merging. Mercury PCN merged with Unitel to become Mercury one-to-one -one at launch. The GSM digital standard had been hard to establish, but so was the challenge to manufacturers. Mercury PCN, where I was at the time as chief executive, found it difficult handset manufacturers to commit. I offered one manufacturer uh, an order for a million mobiles just to see whether they make the investment in the, in the development that was needed and they turned it down. In Germany the networks were ready to launch but they had no handsets. <laughs> and at the February 1991 GSM Congress in Cannes, these buttons were issued for calling for God to send mobiles. This is management, who was, uh, was one of the operators with a license, the network was ready to go. They didn't have any, any handsets. So it's not all a slam dunk. Anyway, all's well. The log jam for mobiles was broken in May 1991 when the technical issues for manufacturers were solved. The UK's Orbital was the first to get regulatory approval, and Motorola launched its first GSM mobiles in September 1991. Nokia hit the market in November from nowhere and was soon a market leader. The next stage of the revolution brought a digital handset capable of developing in today's smartphones. The phone and the customer identity were separated with the SIM card. Text messaging was enabled, marking the beginning of the end for radio paging outside hospitals. The big market throughout Europe enabled volume manufacturers which allowed prices to come down. Ownership was moving from the company to the individual. The development of GSM was being closely watched across the world. I was invited to Beijing in late 1988 to brief the Chinese as the European standard was being challenged by one being developed in the US. They had to choose. And ultimately, they chose GSM. In 1992, I took a new role at Cable & Wireless. I was asked by the new chairman, Lord Young, to develop cable and wireless cellular interests across the world as GSM licenses came up for bidding and they followed the US and the UK example of competitive supply. We had a number of successes. We won licenses or share of licenses in places like Australia, South Africa, shown here, that we put into the South African government. Germany, Bulgaria, and Colombia, as well as others. But then what? Well, I moved in 1983, 1993 to head up cable and wireless operations in the Caribbean, which was nice, 
Atlantic, Africa, the Middle East, and Pakistan, and left Cable and Wireless in 1995 to join Dr. Now Sir Mo Ibrahim at Mobile Systems International, where, where I was Group Managing Director. He'd been the head of radio planning at Cellnet from soon after we launched, and was really a great had a great responsibility for, for the planning of the most intensive network in London that we had at launch, even though we couldn't make a phone call on the day. Looking back, cellular, I think, has been transformative. There are now more than 7 billion mobiles in the world. Smartphones have changed society. But of course, I always said this in 1984 when people talked about Big, Big Brother. They all have an off switch. Thank you very much. John, thank you for that. Uh, it, it's fascinating to, to listen to you going back in an era which I think I, looking around the room, I, I think is well within the lifetime uh, of everybody here. <laughs> Um, can I invite questions uh, in the room and uh, for those watching, if you want to ask questions, if you indicate that on the chat, uh, then I will uh, invite you to put your question. But uh, perhaps as a, yes. Uh, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> you talked, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting and uh, good to see what was going on, I was in the computer industry and you were uh, developing mobiles. Um, and uh, a particular thing that caught my ear was uh, uh, your mention of international cooperation and uh, obviously talking about the uh, penetration of uh, mobile phones across different countries. Um, but also standards and uh, uh, the, the development into the GSM standard and so on. But uh, in computing, uh, we had standards for communications, uh, the ISO seven layer model. Yeah. And uh, I wondered at what point uh, the use of the technology of mobile phones uh, linked in with the, uh, the ISO model. I think that, that, that probably came after this period with the development, well, at, at the end of this period, with the development, when the, when the potential of, of, of mobiles as computing devices rather than means of making telephone calls yes. took place. So 1993? At the beginning of the 90s. Yeah. That would have taken place because um, I, I, we certainly had the view in the late 80s, and there's... Uh, I've only got on, on, on an old uh, video of VHS. I, I, I can't find a way of... When we looked at what your phone could do, we used a model of a flip phone, which would give you the sort of information you now have on your smartphone. And for that... And, and of course, the other great thing is what happened in the 90s and the 2000s, I suppose, is it's an interesting challenge for mobile operators, is that the value generated in the network move from the network provision where there was spent up demand to people like apple yeah. who i think monetized it incredibly well where you bought apps which ran on on your mobile which was entirely transparent to the network both the internet and also the communications networks um they got they, they got that money so the cellular became a transport network for computing capability and with as I mentioned Moore's law and it became easier for the for the customer to be able to access things as we do now you don't think about it you just tap on and that's all you get but that that was a, a, a deep integration that took place later between what was happening with the internet and computing <coughs> let's call it that and the mobile communication systems thank you yeah. it was an interesting thought about changeover from the pager to the cellular phone mm -hmm. um, in 86 87 i was looking at uh, public transport uh, as 
a theme for, in fact, for a television program, which we never got to make. But um, one of the things was that they started introducing information screens on bus stops. And they had three pilot schemes, one in Piraeus, one in Frankfurt, and one in Southampton. And I got to look at the one in Southampton. But it was actually it was very interesting because they were using pager circuits which were dropping out of use because of the rise of cellular to send the information to a scrolling screen at each bus stop. That's right. And uh, that, that I thought was, you know, it was quite significant. The other thing, of course, is that I think if you go to Lancaster railway station, there is still a telepoint sign screwed onto the wall. <laughs> and in Cloth Fair in London, until they refurbished it very, very late on, there was still a waffle radio area for Rabbit oh, on yes. the Hand and Shears pub. <laughs> <laughs> so these things have, you know, sort of had a, a, a much wider context than just the private individual use. I mean, I, I, in 1986, I was also responsible for the radio paging network. Mm. And what we found then was we had the first, uh, well, you remember pages went from, you know, they sent you messages as well as going beep. We yeah. developed uh, alphanumeric. Yeah. And we were developing alphanumeric with, with a feedback, small feedback capability. We only had, you know, very, very thin, you know, very, very small data streams. And, and using them for, for, for bus timetables and other things like that was one of the things we were trying to develop because we had the largest radio paging, national radio paging network in the world. And you could see it going over the edge of a cliff. <laughs> yes. So how do we, how do we keep, keep the handle turning? Such is life. Was it, is it still true that people like the RN, RNLI still rely on pages rather than text because text can get held up being a computer? buffered thing whereas a pager when you hit the transmit it goes out if you want to launch a lifeboat you yeah. don't want to get the message tomorrow they may, they may do i don't know i don't know i know it's yeah. still in use in hospitals right because i know if that you need, if you need somebody quickly yeah they tend to be um you know, they're, they're not wide area systems they're, they're within within it yeah, yeah but yeah. But I know that the lifeboats and think or mountain rescue, the things that needed yeah. there now, yeah. couldn't rely well, on they text. What that means if it goes off. Mm. I think that they do use pages because basically all they need is an instant sound. They know where they're going. Yeah. The message is the sound, get us a new info station or whatever. They're cheap. Uh, certainly they were using them in Cornwall as recently as a year ago. They are for the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the private network. Yeah. Tony Davis has a question. Tony, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, good, Tony. Okay, well, I, I did type it out, but uh, just to repeat it, that I remember that uh, around about 1990, uh, there were a lot of people who were claiming and making what I believe were bogus claims that all these uh, uh, mobile phones and mobile phone networks in particular represented some sort of hidden biological hazard and therefore they should be not anywhere near where there are children or schools or anything like that. I think there's still some opposition to having a mobile phone mask just near a school. I just wondered if you had any comments on that era when I think now people are not so fussed about it. They've just got used to the fact that um, mobile phones have evolved in the way that Darwin, Darwin said that, uh, you know, uh, live things evolve, the trees and plants and animals evolve, survival of the fittest, and that's exactly what mobile phones do. No, I think, I think, the, the, I think it, it, it happened, as you say, in the early 90s, there was a, a number of scares of... Uh, uh, what would the it's, it's microwave radiation what mm. would it do to your brain what would it do to children's brain yes exactly. and a lot of work was done um in, uh, f with with us in the 80s by motorola mm. to look at at, uh, at this and then later on a pan-european and beyond stage in the 80s with in the 90s with gsm mm. 
Uh, and the key matter, as I, I said, well, uh, let me say, there were no harm, no harm was found. Mm -hmm. there were no, um, and now we've got 40 years experience. I don't, I still think that's the case, that um, there, there doesn't seem to be a build up. And it is important, as I said during the presentation, the, free, the, the, the power output of these devices uh, you know, has to be has to be carefully managed. Hmm. You can't, you know, you can't have uh, you can't have a, um, hundreds of watts beaming into your ear. That's why building a mobile network for handheld portables was so uh, so important and quite, quite difficult because of the size of the cells that were required. And it's true today. But the, the outputs are are measured in in, in microwatts, uh, and and so therefore the um, the, the potential damage. Uh, I do remember uh, just a, a bit of an anecdote, which I'm sure break, 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 break the train a bit, but I'm sorry. In 1992 or 1992, one of these scares came up and we, we did, some, did some work. Oh, we looked at all the work. And I found in the working group that I chaired that actually uh, for certainly uh, using an electric razor was probably dodgy. I actually went back to wet shaving then <laughs> <laughs> because of the field that's generated by the motor in the, in the electric car. Uh, not something that necessarily bothers yourself. <laughs> I mean, there are far better solutions. Yes, the best suit of my safety first. <laughs> but when, and wet shaving actually does a much better job, doesn't it? No oh, question. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> or, or you can grow a beard, although I don't fancy that myself. Uh, there's a question, um, Jay Terry asks, what are your thoughts on 2G outlasting 3G? Uh, I, I think ultimately it's a question of, we're back to what is this computer in your pocket demand? And I think that uh, some of the, they're being, it's being tested at 4G now, never mind 2G or 3G. Um, you, you need to move on in order to to get the efficiencies from from the latest technology, the latest uh, chips, and so on and so forth. And, and we're working on five G now, in order to. And it's it's not. It, it's I say it's about computing. It's not not necess, It's not just about mobile. Not about mobile telecommunications. It's about what you need in order to fulfil most of the things you can. Well, all the things that you can do on a desktop or a uh, a pad in your pocket. Well, I'm not, most pads are networked now with, with cellular systems. Isn't 2G used for tracking cars and vehicles and being stolen because it's only location information? I, I, I must admit, I don't know. Um, uh, I would only say it's a question of the frequencies. Uh, the gold dust in all of this is frequencies. Uh, and that's why, of course, as well as 1800, they've gone to 2400. And they're looking at 2,800 now. Uh, and, and indeed, the, yeah. 20 years ago, the Germans were, were looking at, at, at much higher levels, which are clean. The problem is that the lower down the frequency range you get, and I gave some examples of that with the 800, you've, you've actually got a lot of people who want those frequencies. So it was just fortuitous that the government was able to strong arm the military to give up frequencies, and 405 line television had come out of, of use. Um, but, but you, you know they are they are the really finite limitation on on mobile uh, capacity, apart from getting smaller and smaller cells, micro cells. What's the general size of a cell now compared to when things kicked off initially? Well, I think probably the ones in we, when we opened in 1985, we had 25 cells in London. Uh, mainly, mainly, <coughs> you know, within the North Circular, which were able, capable of supporting you know, the old um, motor oil equivalent of, of this. I should think there's probably, I don't know, 10,000, 15, 20,000 cells in that period in that area now, and and there, you know, places like this would be would be full of them. Of course, the the other adjunct to that is is the comment I made on um, the fact that telepoint didn't work, but uh, you'd be surprised how much of the time you spend making mobile calls on your hand portable over a Wi-Fi network. 
certainly uh, it was you know, the, the operators worked up to the fact that if you're sitting in a room and you have Wi-Fi coverage, <coughs> they can connect to you much better through that than they can through the wide area network. So the two of them have come together, and of course it gives you it gives you much more it gives you higher capacity as well because you know, it's not over the radio part. Well, there's only a small link over the radio part. Yeah. Sorry to come back again. Uh, a question about uh, frequency. I used to be IT manager with Dictaphone International, and uh, our engineers preferred 900 megahertz rather than 1800 because of their locations that they had to work in, like basements and uh, places where switches were quite uh, heavily involved. Uh, because of the better reception with 900 megahertz. So they chose Vodafone and O2 uh, that used 900 megahertz. Is that still true? Well, 900 is still used, but so are other frequencies as well. I mean, both Vodafone and uh, O2 have access to, uh, as they've been launched to, uh, uh, to, the 90, to the 1800 and 2400, probably also no i think i think you're right i mean at my my feeling has always been as we knew that the intelligence in handsets are able to hop between frequencies economic logic is to actually use a variety of frequencies depending upon where you are so for, to have 450 or out in you know in the wilds where there's population density of three per square uh, mile, 1800 or 2400 is an expensive way of serving those people. But 450, or what I didn't say is the old system four operated at 120 <laughs> megahertz. Uh, or, and so actually having having frequencies which suit the environment and, and your phone recognizing, which you can do, that you operate between them, actually would it would make it. Uh, you know, would, would help with the economy of building networks. I said when 1900 was launched, uh, having been in there, I saw the reaction by the various various boards of suddenly saying, well, in order to get the same coverage as the 900 networks, you need to spend this much because you need two or three times as many cells. And I said, the bridge too far. That's when you got the mergers and, and they're, they're still taking place. So I think I think it's um, there is there is something to be said for for looking at appropriate use of frequencies. But the licensing system has probably means that that can't happen. Yes, please. Um, Thank you. Just a, a, an observation on on TPO telephones or what, whatever we might go back to. Um, there always seemed to be a reluctance within the state body to accept new technology at a marketing level. Was there any indication that this was something which either led to the competitive tendering or actually waited for, for the political will to have competitive tendering rather than rolling out a national based system Monopoly, government monopoly. I, I think it was. I, I don't think so. I think the GPO and the post office was a, you know, was a an interesting body. Having worked, you know, when I when I actually joined, it was a GPO. I was a civil servant for two years, which is quite amazing. But it, it had been quite innovative. Hmm. If you look back at the thirties, uh, with with the things they did to promote telephone usage until there became a shortage. The marketing was very good. Uh, and they employed, you remember the GPO film unit, John Grierson, yeah. did things for telephone. Everyone remembers it for the night mail and Benjamin Britton and WH Jordan, but they did things for tele telephones as well. And that continued through after the war, subject to the restrictions. I think there was a bit of a setback, however, on the technical side, in as much as, so I'm told, this is before my time, you know, GPO tried to go digital in the, I think the 50s or in the 60s. Highgate Wood. Highgate Wood. 
Yeah, full, full. And uh, people who don't know, they, they did it with valves rather than transistors. And one, one uh, guy I knew said that, that we always knew when they were testing the exchange around Highgate, because when they switched it on, all the street lights dimmed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I think that actually, and that actually had a, had a consequence, which manifested itself in, um, in, in, in the switches that, that came together. And you know, that's why they were a bit late getting off the, the mark with digital. But I think, I think if they had the offering, uh, they were also much bound by our government. Anyone who worked, at, and I worked at the centre for a time in the, in the, in the, in the 70s, uh, working for the chairman at that time. And, and you, couldn't, you, you, know, you couldn't move without government permission. So it became increasingly difficult. I don't think, I don't think you know, there is a tradition of, of innovation, but you know, some, some bad experiences. Question over there. I used to work for our NEC during the period <clears throat> which you've mentioned, and it's very interesting to note that technological progress doesn't mean not every manufacturer could keep up. NEC was one of the market leaders against Motorola at the time. But when GSM came along, they although they were the biggest manufacturer of semiconductors in the world, they couldn't do the digital signal processing. And in fact, uh, they opened, I was based in Camden Town. And they opened up a branch in Reading and they hired mm, a dozen British digital signal. There would be computer uh, programmers at that time, but that failed and NEC dropped out of the market altogether. And just amazing how one moment you can be big. Nokia was huge, dropped out of the market. Um, now the, uh, and I don't uh, with Panasonic, we have phones, they disappeared and just, I, I'm, it's just very strange that even some companies with all those resources just don't have enough. And I was actually I went to a talk this week um, about what's happening in Taiwan and T T C S N T Taiwan Semiconductor T S M. The, the people who manufacture the the chips for iPhones is the only company in the world that can do most of the the big things. And what's going to happen tomorrow when the Chinese get Problematic, and nobody knows. But I just, and I was, and another talk I went to was somebody from um, Schlumberger. He was doing, uh, talking about test equipment. And he was telling us that the, the, the technical step up from tax to GSM was huge and it was in mind boggling. And then when it went on to the higher levels, he said it's even more mind boggling. And it's hardly anybody seemed to have a, a total grasp because tax, I remember the, the spec for tax, I, I've got it, it was a sort of A4. Uh, at this big, the t the the specs for GSM was about ten large volumes, if I remember right. Was, rightly. So we uh, sent it to the Chinese. <laughs> they didn't have any. <laughs> we sent a parcel. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I think it's interesting. I mean, Motorola, who actually invented the mobile telephone, uh, for, for use during U.S. troops, uh, U.S. troops in the war, and they were they were this big, and huge things, but they weren't. And um, and they were the leaders in the market for, for years, but they, they went. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting and, if you take technically incredibly challenging. And I remember going to visit NEC at their new, brand new headquarters in Tokyo to try and get them to. to uh, we were trying. To come we, we into did. GSM and they, they couldn't do it. We were doing testing in Regent's Park. And the guys came over, and they. But it was a very primitive kind of test at that time. It was basically almost not proof of concept rather yeah. than any kind of development. So I think that was about 1990s. So I can quite see why they wouldn't be able to produce a million by next week. Yes, just a, a quick one. Uh, you, you mentioned the word rabbit, and I was going to ask anyway. Where, where did Rabbit fit into this? Were they a reseller for for um, Telepoint or something like that? I mean, given there was government control over all these things. Uh, the operator, or was it something that um, sideways? I recall Rabbit was a se totally separate uh, concept. Well, they were allowed to do it, yeah. Radio based. Oh, no, Rabbit it was off, it, it was, was Hutchinson's, Hutch, wasn't it? Hutchinson's, yeah. it's yeah. the, the equivalent to your telepoint, but that's right. Yeah. 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 I wonder whether it was a resold telepoint or whether the government actually allowed another one to. No, there were several licenses issued, I think. Oh, okay, right. Uh, yeah. For 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 uh, so that specific thing, yeah. For for telepoint, yeah. Yeah. I can't remember how many now. Um, 
certainly, that's right, Rabbit was one of them. And it wasn't Rabbit when you went home, you then had just a cordless phone at home. That's right, yeah, it worked off of that. And it was, I say, the, it just, um, unfortunately, they weren't able to make it. Well, in hindsight, it was, it was too late to the... Overtaken by technology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, John, at that point, perhaps um, we uh, might conclude, as far as I can see, there are no further questions online. Um, uh, there yes, I do have a question online. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. Yes, I beg your pardon. I didn't uh, pick up a hand. I think you had your hand up and I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Yes, away you go. Uh, yes, I I just wanted to know, ask about the uh, sell-off of Cellnet by BT. Um, I mean, it did seem to me uh, um, at the at the time that that seemed to be a, a mad idea because the future seemed to be cellular rather than fixed landlines, um, and there was BT selling off Cellnet. So I wondered whether you thought that was a terrible mistake and. Were you in a position to do anything to stop that happening at the time, or I'd already I'd already left and gone to work for cable and wireless. Um, I think whatever I say will incriminate me. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was madness. It was it was BT at that time responding to the city, who said you've got this asset within your portfolio because by then BT had brought out Securicor and were 100% owners of Cellnet. So it became BT Cellnet. Uh, and they, so they forced them, not forced, they forced, they encouraged BT to, as you remember, to, to split out Cellnet and it became uh, an independent, a quoted company and was promptly bought by Telefonica. And 20 years later, I suppose, BT bought EE. Uh, do I, I, I think it was strategically in, um, a mistake. Um, I, I, did actually, I did actually have another um, rather different question, and that was about um, the time when uh, you were try when the different national champions were trying to um, introduce their own uh, standards. And uh, the one that prevailed in the end, as you said, said was Cellnet. It was a GSM, um, and that seems to me to be rather similar to the situation where the UK was trying to promote their own internet internet standards um, based on the seven layer model and OSI and and all the rest of it, um, and and that too was a complete failure. It does seem to have been uh, your story seems to have been slightly more successful in that. <laughs> the it did come to be a realization that trying to promote um national champions was a mistake uh whereas uh the the realization that um the national champion in in the osi world was a mistake never really came about they just had to give up because nobody used it well, I, 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 I really i best comment just on selling is what i what I said, I thought it was a tremendous example of what you can do um, without, stult without stultifying competition with international cooperation. Um, and um, I, I think it was excellent. We, we, we would not have had the growth in the market that we had. And I think it's outstanding today. You know, you've got well, it's over seven, seven, seven and a half, seven point four billion people in the world. It's completely bypassed the fixed network in places like Africa mm -hmm. uh, and the Middle East. Um, and I remember when you know we saw that potential in South Africa when I was there, uh, and in China. I mean, when I first went to China, they didn't know where half the lines went out of Beijing. No idea, and the coverage was was tiny. I mean, they're just roaring ahead now, so they, you don't need to build a fixed network in order to have effective telecommunications or you know, commute to computing. So it was for me, uh, it was good. And it was unusual that national differences. I mean, still there was an interest in, in promoting uh, industry, but, but the national differences were put to one side. And I remember uh, 
Geoffrey Patty, who was the Minister of State who signed the Quadripartite and I think later became uh, chairman of Plessy. And they said to me, he thought it was the best thing you've ever done in politics. So I think there was a realisation that it was positive. Was GSM based on, on any of the national standards or did it take a bit from each or was it no. just complete no. abolition? show? No, because the national standards were, were, were very much analogue. Um, you had, uh, you know, you had the, uh, in Germany it was a 450 system uh, and they had one export market which was to actually to South Africa uh, and France had uh, a system that was also I think at 450 which they were trying to develop and sell. Um, but they, you know, they, they weren't digital. Um, they hoped to be digital, uh, and and the work between two thousand uh, between nineteen eighty two and nineteen eighty six was was still uh, you know, once once the accord started was very much aimed at trying to get some national advantage for a manufacturer, which which it, it didn't work because the market itself by then the market demand was seen to be there, and this you know, working at this pace was actually going to cause more problems than it solved. So I think it was wonderful that, that we came together, put this team together in, I think it was in Nice uh, or south of France, the permanent nucleus, and they did a, a fantastic job supported by the national, uh, they were still largely monopolies then. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, John, uh, thank you for that.